So welcome everybody to Skype a Scientist Live. We're so happy that you're here with us today. Um, as a, let's see, next week, just so you know what's going on, we're just gonna be talking about um, how to clean up sites that have been uh, like polluted with some toxic stuff, um, ways that we can do that. That's gonna be um, next week and we'll have some other stuff coming up too. If you want, you can um, sign up for um, our um, newsletters. So you get weekly emails about uh, the sessions. And so go on Skype a Scientist's uh, Twitter account after this and I'll post that link as well. Um, just so we know, this is a nonprofit organization. And so we, uh, this is my full time job running this program and connecting scientists with as many people as humanly possible. And we're really pushing right now to be able to hire a part time staff member because this program has gotten so big during this coronavirus time, which is awesome, um, but also means we need a little bit more help behind the scenes. And so if you can help support us, that would mean the world to us. Um, and we can do more cool stuff um, if we have more support. You can do that at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist. Or uh, for one-time donations, you can do paypal.me slash Skype a Scientist. This week has been super awesome because we've teamed up uh, with the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles County to uh, bring awesome people who work at that museum um, to talk to us. And today we're going to be hearing about sharks and fish um, with Bill Lutt. And so with that, um, I think I'll hand it over to you, Bill. Sounds great. Well, thanks everyone for uh, being here. Uh, today, I'm just going to share a little bit about what my job is like at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. So if you've never been to the Natural History Museum in LA, um, I highly encourage you all to visit, but I'm going to give you a little, before we chat and get into our discussion and questions, I'm going to give you a little bit of a virtual tour of the museum and really more specifically what happens behind the scenes. So I'm going to share my screen really quick. Okay. So, if you've never been to the Natural History Museum, this is what it looks like on the outside. We have wonderful nature gardens, uh, we have a very cool whale skeleton, uh, and always, always a lot of different flyers and advertisements for um, exhibits that we have traveling through the museum. And like many museums, you can go inside and we have a lot of wonderful dioramas uh, and other exhibits that really highlight life on our planet, both extinct and currently alive. So you can see skeletons of things uh, like dinosaurs that lived a long time ago, uh, or large mammals that lived a little bit more recently, or currently living animals uh, you can see in dioramas that look like what they would look like in the natural environment. But what while we do love these exhibits and take our job um, very seriously as educating the public and showing them life on our planet, one thing that people don't get to see, unfortunately, many times uh, is what happens behind the scenes. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. So behind the scenes in any natural history museum that is a research active natural history museum, we have a lot of biological collections. So you might go behind and see scenes like this, where you can have boxes or drawers or shelves full of specimens that come from all over the world uh, and that were collected at many different times. So again, you might see a lot of birds uh, or insects or boxes full of skeletons. Again, just documenting life on our planet uh, and life on our planet, how it changes over time as well. Now, my job specifically deals with uh, fishes. So my official job title is the Assistant Curator of Ichthyology. This is really just a fancy way of saying two things. Uh, the first thing, it's a fancy way of saying that I'm a fish scientist, that's the ichthyology part. And then the other part of my job is uh, the curator part, which is taking care of a large fish collection. And why fishes, I get asked a lot. And I research fishes because I think they're absolutely fascinating. Uh, and they are extremely diverse, and that's what I find very appealing about them. Here on our coast in California, you can see really wonderful and diverse and kind of strange looking fishes, everything from a large California sheep's head on the upper left to very colorful orange Garibaldi, which is our state fish in California, to very creepy kind of looking sarcastic fringe head, uh, which might look like an alien from the Predator movies. But if you look at fishes all across our planet, you see even more remarkable diversity. You see fishes coming in many different sizes and shapes, colors, uh, patterns. They 
live in very different habitats. And so my own research really aims to kind of figure out how this diversity evolved uh, and where fishes have lived on our planet and how that's changed over time. So that's one aspect of my job is the, the research part. But the part that I really wanna talk about today uh, deals with our collections at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. So I like to think of our collections kind of like a library. A uh, library has a lot of books. Each book is full of uh, information. It can be published at different points in time. Uh, they might be published all over the world in different places. And so our collection is just like a library, except instead of books, we keep fishes. A lot of people tend to ask if it looks like this, a room full of tanks with live fishes in it. Uh, we actually don't have any live fishes at all. All of our specimens are preserved research specimens. And our collection actually looks like this. This is officially titled the Robert J. Lavenberg Fish Collection. Uh, it is named after one of our most influential uh, past curators, Bob Lavenberg. And you can see it's full of rows and rows of movable shelves. If you looked at any of these shelves, you'll see that they're full of jars and metal tanks. And all of these jars are our books, essentially, in a library. Each jar has fishes in it that is, are full of different types of information. Most of our specimens uh, look, are adult specimens that can look very different. So these are preserved specimens. You can see that they've lost a lot of their color. Uh, they unfortunately lose color in the preservation process. But in, in addition to keeping adult specimens like these, uh, we also have different types of specimens that we keep because different researchers want to look at uh, and study different things. So we have a large skeletal collection, which includes uh, everything from large shark jaws to skeletons of small and large fishes. Most of our skeletons aren't articulated like this. Uh, they're kind of uh, disarticulated and just in boxes. Uh, but we also have a different type of specimen that allows researchers to look at bones as they are in the fish's body. So we have a large collection of cleared and stained material. These are specimens where we use a special enzyme to digest away uh, skin and muscle. Uh, so you can see through the fish uh, and we can stain bone and cartilage different colors with different dyes, allowing you to study the bones in the fish. And we also keep uh, collections of larval fishes or baby fishes uh, because they look very different than adults. Uh, and also we keep a collection of otoliths, which sometimes are called fish ear bones or ear stones. Uh, otoliths, you can do a lot of different research on, um, but a lot of people will use them kind of like uh, tree rings to figure out how old a fish is. So kind of how a tree adds different rings as it gets bigger uh, and grows older. Otoliths kind of act in a similar way. So those are some of the physical specimens that we have in our collection. Uh, we also like to keep a lot of digital information associated with each specimen too, just to increase the amount of information uh, for everything in the collection. So when we're in the field, uh, this is a close friend of mine, Caleb McMahon, who works at the Field Museum of Natural History. And what we'll do when we're in the field, we uh, will take pictures of the site like this river here, but you can also see in this picture that we're setting up a camera to take uh, digital images of fresh specimens. Um, so we can get nice live coloration. Like I said, when we preserve fishes, the color goes away, but that color can be very important. So we take live uh, pictures of color and we also take fluorescent images if we can, uh, because some fishes biofluoresce. That is, they reflect wavelengths of light that we can't see with our naked eyes but using special filters, we can also get this information that the fishes might be using uh, to see one another as well. In addition to live colors, we keep other digital media uh, like x-rays, but more recently actually CT scans. So if someone can't visit our collection uh, physically, they can actually still access information online and still do the research they want to do. Um, so they can download these CT scans and look at any bone uh, that they might want to see, or they even might get little extra bits of information, like in this case, what a fish was eating before uh, it was collected. You can see there's some stomach contents there. And we keep genetic information too. So we take genetic samples, uh, tissue samples from each specimen. Different researchers can sequence this and uh, figure out uh, the sequence of DNA in each specimen, and we can store that information and associate with each specimen. So in many ways, that's how I view our collection, kind of like a library. Again, each 
book in a library is full of information. Each fish we have is also full of information and they come from all over the world and from different time points as well. Uh, before I get into questions though, uh, that's all I have for my short presentation, but before I get into questions, I will want to like to say, if you want to learn more about any of our collections at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, you're free to visit the website. Uh, we have started a new program called LA Connects, uh, where you can find a lot of really cool digital media, especially for these times uh, when you might be stuck at home. So definitely go check that out. And if you want to see more about fishes specifically from our collection, I run an Instagram account called Planet of Fishes, where I post pictures from uh, fish, uh, fishes that I come across in our collection uh, or out in the field when I'm collecting. And that's all I'm going to do for now. And I'm happy to start ask, uh, answering some questions. Awesome. Thanks so much for that. So the first question we have is how do you take genetic samples? So to take genetic samples, it's actually pretty easy with fishes. Uh, you typically just need either a fin clip, like a small piece of the fin, uh, or any other genetic material that you could get. Sometimes a, a muscle clip will also work. And you just preserve it um, either in liquid nitrogen, you flash freeze it, or you can put it into ethanol as well. Awesome. Uh, Madison would like to know a question that's near and dear to my heart. Do you have any squid in your collection? Do I have any what in my collection? Squid. <laughs> oh, we don't in the fish collection, but we do have a marine invertebrate collection that has squid. So uh, we only keep fishes with or vertebrate uh, fishes with backbones, um, basically, and squid aren't vertebrates. So we don't have them in our fish collection, but we do have them in the building. Awesome. What's your favorite part of your job? Favorite part of the job uh, is definitely going out and collecting fishes. Um, traveling the world to see uh, very cool exotic fishes from different locations, things that are new to me and sometimes even new to science. Uh, that's a very exciting part of the job uh, that I really enjoy. Awesome. How many types of fishes are there? So currently there are over 35,000 recognized species, uh, which is just a massive amount of uh, described fishes on our planet, but that number is only increasing year after year. Uh, if you go to, there's an online repository of valid accepted species of fishes actually, uh, called Catalog of Fishes, and if you go to that website, you can actually look at how many species have been described each year, and in nine out of the last 10 years, more than 365 species have been described on average in nine out of the last 10 years. So more than one new fish per day, basically. So that number, that so, number just keeps on going up. That's wild. Um, let's see, do you have any alligator gar in your collection? Yeah, we do have alligator gar. So we have a couple different types of gar in the collection. Uh, gar are very cool. They have very tough skin. Um, and I did my PhD in Louisiana where there's a lot of gar, so I, I really like those fishes. They're so cool. I like them so much. I also, uh, there's a guy named Solomon David on Twitter who oh, yeah. just talks about them all the time. So if you're looking for an engaging person to follow on Twitter for science, he's awesome and really is like the biggest cheerleader possible for the, for the GAR. Um, let's see, Anna would like to know, what's the most interesting specimen you've ever collected? Hmm, some of the deep sea fishes that you come across are the most interesting just because Deep sea fishes can get really strange. Um, so one of the fishes that I think is, is the strangest, I'm gonna share my screen again, just really briefly, but we have in our collection, a fish called a barrel eye, sometimes a spook eye fish uh, or tube eyes. These are really weird specimens. So basically this fish has a transparent skull. It can look up through its skull. It can rotate its eyes forward and up. It's a deep sea fish. Uh, and some of those are just always the weirdest when you come across them. So I think those might be some of my favorites. That's cool. Um, let's see, how many sharks do you have in your collection? Ooh, Say a different that's thing. a... That's a, that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head exactly how many shark specimens we have. We have two full rows of those compactor shelves uh, full of sharks though. And in fact, in addition to jars on the shelves, we also have a lot of large metal tanks for larger specimens. Uh, and a lot of our tanks have sharks or rays, um, larger specimens in them. So we have a decent amount of sharks in the collection. 
cool. Um, do fish have ears? Do fish have ears? Not like you would think with us. Uh, so no external, uh, you know, body parts that channel sound, but fish can hear. Um, and they have those ear bones or otoliths that we call. So it's not quite the same as what you might be thinking of as ears. Cool. Um, what's the biggest fish that's ever existed? That has ever existed? Hmm. Well, the biggest fish right now that is currently living is the whale shark. But I do think, I'm not a shark expert, unfortunately, but I do think that Megalodon was bigger than a whale shark. So I think that might have been the biggest, but again, I'm not quite sure. I study a lot of currently living fishes. Cool. Um, so we've got two questions that are pretty related to each other. Uh, one, do any fish use bioluminescence? And another question is, do you have any angler fish in your collection? So those are definitely related to one another. Do fishes use bioluminescence? Absolutely. And angler fishes are a great example of that. They have um, a lure you might see in like Finding Nemo. It's actually a modified dorsal fin that they uh, poke forward and have a little light uh, that it can attract fishes uh, that they might eat or other prey. Uh, so lots of fishes do bioluminescence, especially in the deep sea. Um, and there's that distinction between bioluminescence and biofluorescence. So bioluminescence, they produce their own light. Biofluorescence, they just reflect different uh, wavelengths of light. And we have quite a bit uh, in terms of angler fishes in the collection, including some large specimens too. One of our uh, largest angler fishes was actually collected from the stomach contents of a sperm whale uh, off the coast. And so that's one, of, that's one of my favorite specimens, I think, too. That is super cool. Um, Anisha would like to know, uh, do water animals have some way to communicate with each other? So you do have uh, fishes that communicate in different ways. They're not talking with one another. They'll communicate either in their body language, so how they move around. Uh, they can kind of do aggressive displays to scare off other fishes. Uh, but there are fishes that make sound as well. Um, so it's not talking, uh, but they will, you know, sometimes they grind certain bones in their throat to make grunting sounds. Um, and so they can communicate in different ways. Cool. Um, so where is your favorite place that you've ever gone to collect fish? Hmm. I really liked Japan. Uh, I thought Japan was a very interesting place to go diving and, and seeing the, the different fishes there uh, because it was where I was in Japan it was a strange mixture of kind of some temperate fishes, so fishes that you typically only see in colder waters, uh, mixed with some uh, seasonal coral reef fishes that might not be there over winter, but because the waters were a little warmer over the summer, there was a mixture of some uh, tropical coral reef fishes. So I think that was one of my favorite places uh, to see the fishes in their natural environment. Awesome. I've, I went to Japan to collect squid, and it is one of my favorite places to go to collect animals. Because Yeah, it was just beautiful. So much awesome squid life. Um, let's see. Do you have a favorite fish of all the fish? This always changes you know it's too with over thirty-five thousand species it's too hard to pick just one uh and it always changes as i come across different specimens in our collection too so right now i really like those barrel eyes uh, but there are lots of really cool fishes it's just uh, it's just too hard to pick one i'm sorry <laughs> That's fair. um do can any fishes become dry there are fishes that can um, get out of water and survive for a period of time. So you might actually want to YouTube, hmm, might want to YouTube either lungfish or fish in mud. Uh, and you can see a video, there's a video online of a fish being, uh, coming out of the wall of a house essentially, that someone cut mud bricks uh, and there was a fish hibernating inside of these bricks and then it rained and this fish comes out. So yes, fish can leave water. Uh, some of them, not not many, but some of them can come out of water and survive for some time. That's wild. What a fun story. Um, what is the skeleton that's lit up in the picture of uh, like the um, museum's logo? The museum, which logo? The, the would... question is, what is the skeleton that's lit up in the picture of the 
at HMLA? Hmm. Let me see real quick. Because I don't think our logo has dinosaurs on it. it Maybe a dinosaur question. Yeah, the the skeletons that I showed, um, I showed three skeleton or three uh, parts of fishes. I showed a great white jaws on the upper left. I showed a monkfish, uh, which is a type of anglerfish, on the upper right, and then a swordfish are the three skeletons that I showed. Awesome. Um, Joseph would like to know: Do you study fish eggs too? I don't study fish eggs, but we do keep fish eggs in the collection. Uh, so that people who do study fish eggs can uh, come and look at them or request them on loan. Cool. Um, Dennis says, I see a book about the fish of Oman behind you. Does the museum have information about all the fish in the world or is it specialized in certain areas of the world like North America? So we have fishes from all over the world. Uh, we also have a wonderful fish library uh, that contains books uh, from all over the world. Uh, or about fishes from all over the world. Uh, but we definitely have our strengths. And so we have strengths in California fishes uh, because we are right on the coast, but we also have uh, a lot of fishes from the Eastern Pacific. So the coast of Mexico, down to Costa Rica and Panama. Um, so that's one of our strengths, but we do still have fishes from all over the world as well. Awesome. Have you ever been to the bottom of the ocean? No, I would. I would love to get in one of those subs and go down, uh, but it's, it's hard to get a spot on one of those. I am equal parts afraid of doing that and really, really want to. Um, I, have, I have been in a research I, a sub before. I got a, a lucky opportunity last year uh, in Curacao and we went down to a thousand feet, but that is still, that's deep, but yeah, the ocean gets so much deeper. That's, that's, that, it, even that's scary to me, but uh, super cool. Did you see, uh, was it dark enough that the bioluminescent animals were there or? I didn't see any bioluminescence, but I did see fishes that I would not have seen otherwise. So it was deep enough to definitely see that change uh, in the fauna that you see, uh, but not deep enough to where I saw bioluminescence. That's super cool. Um, let's see. So here's a question um, that's just sort of basic. What makes a fish a fish? You would think that that's a basic question, but define, fishes are so diverse that coming up with a way to define them as an inclusive group uh, can actually be kind of challenging because you can use terms like, okay, a fish is a vertebrate that uses gills to breathe that has fins as limbs, but there's lots of fishes that have either reduced or completely absent uh, fins, you know, it, it gets a little more complicated when you look at just the crazy diversity of fishes that there are. But I'd say in general, in general, it's a vertebrate that uses gills to breathe and has fins. Sounds good. Um, let's see. So we obviously, at least I, we can't go to the lab right now because we're all stuck at home. Um, so how do you do your job um, now in these times? So it gets challenging in terms of I can't access the collection. Uh, but I do have a lot of uh, data that I still need to work up and publish. So as a scientist, you know, I, there's many aspects of my job. And luckily, some of those translate to easily to working at home. Uh, a lot of the work that I do actually uses molecular information, DNA, uh, to look at the relationships of fishes. And so that type of stuff I can work on at home uh, because that's just data that I can work up on any computer. Cool. Um, someone says, what is your opinion of blobfish? Blobfish, I like them a lot. Uh, they're really weird. We have a, a couple blobfishes in the collection. Um, we even have a paratype of one of the species and a paratype is just uh, one of the specimens that was used when a species was actually described. Uh, so in that process of describing the species. And so I really like blobfishes. Uh, they're super weird. Um, one of those strange fishes that just is very enigmatic and really cool. Awesome. Agreed. Uh, Linda has a cool question here. Do the fish at the deepest depths of the ocean have eyes? Do they even need eyes? They have eyes. Sometimes they have reduced eyes. Uh, it depends on the species that you're talking about. But a lot of those fishes really deep have reduced ossification. That is, their bones aren't as calcified. Um, so there are adaptations to living that deep, but some of those fishes do have eyes or at the very least very reduced eyes. 
Very cool. Um, Elijah wants to know, uh, how do you, so if you find a fish, do you immediately know what kind of fish it is? Or do sometimes you have to kind of like figure it out by going to the books or how do you do that? This is a great question. Um, and something that I think a lot of people don't think about. With 35,000 species, I would wager a bet that no one knows all the fishes on the planet. There are some people that are extremely good and can identify a lot of what they come across. Uh, but it's just, there's too many fishes to know them all. Um, so we do our best. Uh, we can very quickly generally reduce the possibilities down. Uh, so most of the time we can identify things uh, in areas that we go to commonly. So we know what's there. But every once in a while you'll come across something that can be really hard to identify uh, and you'll have to ask an expert. Uh, so a lot of the times um, we have experts coming through the collection because they want to study the fishes that they specialize in. And so they'll look on the shelves and they'll see some things that might not be identified all the way down to species. It might just be down to the genus that it's in. Uh, and then they'll give you an ID. This is especially true with really tiny fishes like little gobies and blennies. Uh, gobies especially can be really hard and challenging to identify. And there's people that specialize just in those fishes. That's cool. Um, Justine Flores would like to know, what is the biggest fish in your museum and how big exactly is that? So we have a couple really large fishes. Uh, we have a megamouth shark, uh, which is probably our heaviest specimen. I haven't weighed it myself, but it is quite large. Uh, I know that it's so heavy that to move it actually would be quite a challenge. Um, and then we have a couple uh, oar fishes. Uh, those are the longest bony fishes on our planet. And one of the, we do have an oar fish on display, but we also have an oar fish uh, behind the scenes for research that is in a 14 foot long tank and it goes the entire length of the tank and then it doubles back. Uh, so the body's folded in half and comes all the way back and it fits that tank completely. So it's, you know, shy of 30 feet. That would probably be our, our biggest fish uh, or longest fish in the collection. That's wild. Um, Kylie wants to know, how do fishes drink water? So it depends on, uh, fishes a lot of the times have water going through their mouths, uh, just in general, because they have to breathe. So they pass water into the mouths and over their gills. Um, but it depends if they're saltwater fish or freshwater fish. And those two do it differently uh, based on balancing the salt in their body, because they don't want to lose too much salt. And they also don't want to gain too much salt if they're a saltwater fish. So they will either drink a lot, uh, throughout the day to try to keep the salt concentrations from getting uh, too off, uh, or they will basically have to urinate a lot, so they'll let a lot of waste out, depending again if they're freshwater or saltwater. But they'll they'll have their mouth open and taking in water uh, that they have to anyways to breathe. So very cool. Um, Joy would like to know: Have you ever uh, captured fish in caves? I have not uh, done a lot of cave work, uh, but I have worked very closely with people that have worked in uh, caves. So I studied and did my PhD at Louisiana State University. Uh, and my advisor, Prasanta Chakrabarty, has described several cave fishes. Uh, and he has gone into caves and collected them. Uh, I, caves are, you know, I like diving and going underwater and stuff, but caves are narrow spaces, they're dark. Um, I would, I definitely would want to be with a, a caving expert if I went into a cave like that. Valid. Same. Um, let's see, how do you want, like to know, I want to ask a question, what's the deepest point yet reached by humans? Uh, the Marianas Trench, I think, is the deepest point reached by any humans. Yep. I think the Challenger Deep is the deepest part of that deepest part um, yep. that we've been to. Um, let's see, what kind of research can we do using uh, museum collections? Ooh, so many things. We get requests, we get requests from researchers doing all sorts of things. Uh, so in general, a lot of museum collections historically have been looked, uh, used to study uh, evolutionary relationships of organisms, trying to figure out our tree of life, how life originated and uh, diversified on our planet. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, people look at fishes for shape analysis. So looking how body shape changes with habitats or over time. Uh, people look at dietary analysis so we can keep uh, gut contents. People can look at 
uh, heavy metal pollution uh, in our uh, tissue samples. So they can take mus muscle tissue and look at if there's any pollution. And then, I mean, all sorts of questions you can look at with specimen. The, the, and there's many ways of studying these specimens that we probably haven't even thought of yet. You know, new technologies come up and allow us to answer new questions as time goes on. So they're just, it's just full of questions. Very cool. Um, let's see, NHMLA would like to know, do you know how many sharks are in the water total? Oof. Like I said, uh, unfortunately not a shark expert. Um, so I don't have that raw number just off the top of my head, but I can Google it really quickly. An um, important thing I think for everybody to know about scientists is that we don't know everything and that's okay. Um, scientists aren't geniuses, we're just people who are really into one thing, kind of. Google, Google says about 400 species of currently living sharks. Awesome, thank you. And Google is our friend. Um, let's see, uh, are there any fish that can live both in freshwater and saltwater? Yeah, uh, there are definitely fishes that transition between. So I think one great example of peop, uh, that people might know is a salmon. Uh, so, you know, salmon spawn in fresh water. Uh, then they grow, they go up to sea, they grow bigger, and then they come back to freshwater again. So there's um, many more examples other than salmon uh, across the fish tree of life. And some fishes are really good at uh, going between freshwater and marine habitats. Um, but a lot of fishes are restricted to one or the other. Very cool. Um, Elijah would like to know, how do you preserve a fish? So there's a couple ways that you can do it. Uh, the way that we do it is we first um, fix them uh, in formalin. So we put them in a 10% formalin solution. Um, and then we will transfer that for long-term preservation in alcohol. Uh, so usually 70 to 75% ethanol is what we use. And cool. preserving it that way, they can last hundreds of years. Um, so you can come across specimens on our shelves that are several hundred years old. That's so cool. Um, let's see, uh, Amy would like to know, I know this isn't related to fish, but do you have any Yeti crabs in your museum? Ooh, we, we have to get the, the crustacean curator on here. Yeah. That would be a good talk too. Very cool. Um, let's see, are there particular fish, species of fish that are either super peaceful or super aggressive? I'd say most fishes really don't wanna be messed with by you. So I'd say most are pretty peaceful. Um, they're usually kind of scared of you, um, but there are definitely some aggressive ones. Um, and sometimes it's not always the largest fishes that can be aggressive too. I mean, you can have little damsel fishes on reefs that basically they're little farmers. They have their little algal patch that they tend to. Uh, and these tiny little fishes will come at you. I mean, they're not going to hurt you, but they'll be quite aggressive. So sometimes you know, it's not always the ones that you might think of that are aggressive or that have aggressive behaviors, um, but most fishes kind of want to avoid you if you're in the water because you probably look really scary to them when you're big scuba gear with, uh, you know, loud bubbles coming off of you, so. Very cool. Um, Dennis would like to know, does the public have access to your collection or is it only for researchers? So it's typically for researchers, uh, but we do get requests all the time from uh, non-ichthyologists that we let back and use the collection. So sometimes artists want to access the collection uh, and we are more than happy to accommodate that. A lot of times we give tours to the public uh, for educational purposes, either as you know classroom tours uh, or different groups want to come in and we always love showing off the collection. So for the most part it's researchers that use it but we do like uh, to give anyone that we can uh, reasonably uh, access to the collection as well. Very cool. Um, have you personally ever found a new species of fish? So I actually have not. Uh, and some of my colleagues will give me a, a hard time about this sometimes. Uh, but I haven't described any new fishes. I've described new genera. Uh, so higher taxonomy or higher classification changes. Um, but I, instead of describing new fishes, I've actually sunk species. I've uh, combined two species into one. Um, so sometimes you have, you have 
in the fish world of describing species, you have what people call lumpers and splitters. Splitters like to describe a lot of new species. Lumpers like to put them together. Uh, and I guess I fall more in the lumper category right now, but, um, but that might change. Sounds good. Um, what, in your opinion, is the cutest fish in the world and what's the smallest fish in the world? Smallest fish, there's a couple really small fishes. Uh, the genus Schindleria, called infant fishes, are extremely small. There's also a really tiny cyprinid uh, called Pato cypress, uh, and those are some of the smallest vertebrates on our planet. Uh, the cutest fish, ooh, that's pretty subjective. Uh, and I would say, you know, everyone really likes a spiny lump sucker. These are tiny little fishes in intertidal zones that, you know, suction onto rocks. And they're, if you don't know what one is, you should, you should look it up. They're, they're pretty cute. They're incredibly cute. I, I co-sign that answer. That's incredibly, incredibly cute. Um, here's a cool question. Do some fish give live birth or do only mammals do that? No, there's a lot of fishes that will give live birth. Um, a lot of sharks do it. Uh, in fact, in sharks, you can see all different types of um, ways that they give birth. So some sharks will lay egg cases, some will give live birth. So there are definitely fishes that will give live birth. Very cool. Um, we've gotten a couple questions about fish intelligence. Do you have any examples of uh, super smart fish? So fish intelligence, um, there's a whole field of research of people looking at uh, how smart fishes are or how good their memory is. Um, I wouldn't know off the top of my head like what the smartest fish would be, uh, but they're not necessarily as dumb as people might think. Uh, so they can remember, they can remember more than that common saying goes of your goldfish can't remember anything. Cool. Um, let's see. Could you talk more about why uh, that fish that hangs out in the mud would go into the mud to hibernate? So, I talk more about why it would hibernate. Um, it probably why would hibernate. So this, to do that? so fishes might leave the water for a number of reasons, uh, and especially this would be this the fish that I'm talking about is in Africa, um, and there are large seasonal fluctuations in the amount of water available. So it could be very likely due to uh, the habitat it was living in actually went dry, uh, and it would just kind of hunker down and wait till it rains again, which is why once it rains, it would come out of the mud. So I would say that would be a very likely reason for some of these fishes that do leave the water. Cool. Let's see, how are we doing on time? Pretty good. Oh, I think we have time for one or two more questions depending on uh, the complexity here. Let's see, uh, can, um, can fish change sex? Yes, yeah. So. You can have uh, a lot of fishes are either sequential hermaphrodites, so they will go from one sex to another. Uh, great examples are parrot fishes and wrasses do this a lot, um, but also clown fishes will do this. Um, and but then there are also um, simultaneous hermaphrodites as well. So you can have fishes like hamlets that can be both male and female at the exact same time. So there's a lot of weird uh, breeding mechanisms in fishes. Very cool. Okay, final question before we do our final, final questions. Um, can fish change color? Yes. Uh, in fact, you can. there are definitely some really cool clips online of uh, some reef fishes that can change color, um, but you can find a lot of good examples of fishes changing color. Awesome. Um, and some fishes change color from day to night, right? Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, so thank you for all your answers. We always try to keep these to about 45 minutes, um, but just a heads up for our audience, you can request a fish scientist to talk to you um, and just your family or your classroom at home whenever you'd like. Go to skypeascientist.com to do that because we had so many questions. Um, we have still, we answered 80, which is a lot, um, but there are still 188 <laughs> that we didn't get to. So um, I love the enthusiasm in this crew, but uh, you can just request a fish scientist for your own group. Um, it is totally free. That is what we're here for. So feel free to do that. Um, we now have our two final questions that we ask everybody. Uh, the first is, what do you wish that everybody in the world knew about fish? 
And then the second question is, what is something that you wish everybody in the world knew about literally anything? It can be as silly or significant as you'd like. So about fish specific, I really always try to push just how diverse fishes are. I wish people really understood how many different fishes there are. Uh, I think people can really get excited about wildlife um, that they see out and about when they're walking or hiking. So birds, they might see birds or little mammals, uh, or they might see a lizard or a snake and get really excited. I don't think we get the same exposure to fishes. Uh, just because they're underwater, you can't hear them, you can't see them a lot of the times. So I really like to, I wish people really understood how many fishes there are, but also how vulnerable they are in their aquatic habitats too. And there's a lot of changes going on in our coastal habitats. Uh, and we really should think about protecting these fishes because each one evolved to live in, uh, in a specific place and it serves a specific function in the ecosystem. So there's a lot of them out there and they do need our help. Um, and so that would probably be what I'd want people to know about fishes in general. And then about anything, um, I think sometimes people, about anything, I'll still keep it related to my job uh, working in museums. And I think a lot of people don't get to see too much of the behind the scenes uh, aspects. And sometimes when they do, they wonder why we have so many specimens. Uh, so why do we have shelves and shelves of specimens? And I, I think it's important for people to know that Museums are very special in that they're kind of like, um, you know, it's kind of like time traveling without actually time traveling. You can go back to a specific time and place and look at exactly what was there. Uh, and there's no other way that we can prove that something lived at a certain place. So on our very uh, rapidly changing planet, it's really always important to have specimens across many different time points uh, and across the world too. So I think in general, um, yeah, museums are very cool places because they allow you to time travel uh, and we should definitely support the continued collection of uh, animals to document life on our planet as it changes. That's an awesome answer. Okay, uh, that's awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was, I learned stuff and I've been studying marine biology for years. So it's all, yeah, there's always so much more to learn. Erin, um, thank you for signing for us. You are a champ and we are we're just, every day I'm so grateful that you're here. And uh, thank you for taking the time with us today. Um, do you have anything else that you'd like to plug? Places we can find you on social media, anything like that? You can always uh, find out more uh, at the Natural History Museum Los Angeles County website about the fish collection. Um, and again, I have an Instagram account called Planet of Fishes that you can look at uh, to see fishes that I come across in our collections or out in the wild. Um, and other than that, I'd just like to thank you all for those questions. Some of those were pretty challenging, actually. Uh, so it was, it's been a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks again. Um, just as a reminder, you can go to our Twitter account. That's twitter.com slash Skype scientist. Um, and in a minute or two, I will post the link where you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, you can also always sign up for a scientist yourself at skypescientist.com. We have a lot of scientists, so please tell your friends uh, we are available for you. Um, and with that, you can always get our um, schedule for Skype a Scientist on our website as well, so you can see what Skype a Scientist live sessions we have coming up and support us at patreon.com slash Skype a Scientist or paypal.me slash Skype a Scientist. Truly every little bit helps um, over here. So thanks again, and we'll see you next week, everybody.